Hi, welcome back to my channel. This is Shady Atia, and today's presentation is about winning a postdoctoral fellowship under the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions. Well, the audience of today's presentation is early career researchers who are in transition between a PhD and a fixed career job, and candidates who are applying for the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions postdoctoral fellowship. Who can apply for this scholarship? Mainly PhD people who have a PhD degree at the time of the deadline of the application. The official deadline of the application most of the time is in October, but most universities they have a pre-selection deadline in May or in June. So when we talk about here the official deadline, it is the October deadline. Also, you must have a maximum of eight years experience in general. You should not exceed that date. And you should comply with the mobility rules, which requires that you have not resided or carried out your main activities of work or studies in the country of the beneficiary. Very important. Now, what does this funding cover? It covers mainly living allowances, mobility allowances, if applicable long-term and family leave and special needs allowances. And for sure, there is additional funding for research, training, networking activities, and management and indirect costs, and everything related to attending conferences and connecting with your research community. Now, what are the key success criteria for succeeding in this postdoctoral proposal? Four criteria are mainly available. First of all, you, there must be a very strong profile for the PhD candidate and for the promoter. For the promoter, they will look mainly at the age index and the publication record. And for the research candidate, they will look for also for the age index. So if your age index in Google Scholar, I'm not talking about the Scopus age index, I'm talking about the Google Scholar age index. If your age index is five or above, then there is a high chance that he could be taken. Don't forget that this is very competitive candidates from all around the world, some candidates that have a profile of eight, seven, six. So these are very high age indexes. My advice, try to have at least five if possible. Five is okay, four is okay, but less than that, it will be difficult. It depends, give it a try. And there are some additional criteria that can make your uh, candidate or your profile highly ranked. First of all, if you have a master degree or a PhD taken from uh, standardized countries, like Japan, uh, Europe, uh, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Another chance here, if you want to increase your profile uh, uh, rating or score, is to have a previous collaboration with the potential uh, uh, promoter or supervisor who you are working with. Uh, being a member of a scientific community, this need to be very clear. If you show to uh, the uh, examiners or the proposal reviewers that you are a member of a scientific community, you attended the conferences in the last years, you're a contributor, you're a fellow, whatever activities you did with your scientific community in your field, uh, then uh, this is also an additional one. And as I told you before, the H index is key to uh, distinguish candidates. What is next here on the list of evaluation criteria? Feasibility. Your research proposal that you are writing need to be very feasible. When I'm talking about feasibility, you need to make sure that your state of the art is short, condensed, the introduction is short, because most of the time, it's not about making a lot of blah, 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 introduction, two, three pages with this kind of state of the art. In this type of proposal, you need to have a short introduction and then follow directly with the methodology. Also make sure that the project plan is very feasible and make sure that you show that uh, you can publish maximum one publication and that's it. Uh, you don't need to go for more than one journal publication, Q1, you know. Uh, if you want to make a second one, this will not be regarded as something positive. The second can be a conference paper. So my advice, write a simple research proposal and make the dosing or make uh, the sizing of your writing as if you are going to publish one journal article and that you are going to attend one international conference in your scientific community. That's it. If you go more than that, it will be seen as a non-feasible proposal, overloaded proposal. If you go less than that, it will be seen as a very light research proposal. So again, you know what is a publication. You know how to publish in a Q1 publication. If you have a H index that is already Google Scholar index of five, you know what I'm talking about. So just size your proposal as if you are going at the end to publish one paper, journal paper, with a conference paper maximum, but don't overwhelm the reviewers. Once the reviewers think that this project is all over the place, a lot of works, a lot of activities, this person is going to make a second PhD, bye-bye, you are rejected. Next, innovation and relevance. Your proposal has to have a very clear explanation of the innovation and the relevance of the work. 
especially that you make sure that the topic is relevant in the supervisor's country, not in your home country. This is very important. I'm very surprised that many some students apply for doing a postdoc in a foreign country and they impose their problems in their home countries. No, it's not about that. The reviewer community is in the hosting institution. They know what are the societal and technical challenges that they have. So you must write a proposal that is appealing there, not in your home country. Also, your proposal must be aligned with a scientific research community. Like I told you earlier, you have to show that you are already aware about the problems described and are already documented in the literature and the knowledge gap that is already documented in the literature of your scientific community. So don't up, uh, come up with a new problem that we never heard about or a problem that is very little documented. If the problem is not already discussed previously and this gap is already defined through literature reviews and previous publications and in conference papers in your research community, then don't start. So it's important to look at that. Also, your research proposal need to be aligned with industrial or policy stakeholders. This is a better step. If you can connect your research with industry or with policy making or with the ISO standard or with any type of uh, city officials, community uh, authorities in the country where you are planning to conduct your postdoc, it will be uh, useful. I know it's difficult, but I'm just telling you these are all additional criteria that can make your proposal pop up and get distinguished. Also, you need to show that you will gain academic or non-academic experience in other sectors. If you plan within your postdoctoral stay that you are traveling abroad, for example, to uh, visit a research lab for three months, for six months, to uh, acquire a technology, acquire a technique, a protocol, a method, learn to use a tool, uh, a technique, a survey, a way of data processing, data treatment, an algorithm, whatever technique that you will go travel during the postdoc with another institution, this will be very seen as a very positive thing. What should I do in this case? I should emphasize that during my postdoc in the proposal that I'm planning to travel abroad and I must associate that with a letter of acceptance or a letter of invitation or a statement of this host institution or the second university that is saying we are interested to host Mr. or Mrs. X if they get the funding for this fellowship and they can stay in our labs for two or three months to work on this technique or this method or whatever. So this is also very useful. Now let me take you to the last part of the presentation and criteria number four, the methodology. This is one of the most important parts of your post-doctoral uh, uh, proposal. The committee will read it thoroughly. They will make all the best and they will re-simulate as if they are following your step and they will put themselves in your shoes trying to follow every step you describe in the methodology. First of all, show your expertise in the methodology implementation. You already have a PhD. You are going to do a postdoc. Don't invent or use a new methodology. You need to show that you will use the methodology that you are already learned and that you already mastered in your PhD. So this is very important to take into account. Avoid any mixed methodologies. Use only one. Don't mix a qualitative with a quantitative. Don't mix modeling with experimental, with observational, with qualitative. Ah, I'm going to do a survey and I'm going to do observations. Then I will do an experiment and then I will go in a modeling. No, 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 no. If you dis do this mixed methodological approach and if you are going to use methodologies that were not used during your PhD, directly the committee will consider you as an unexperienced person taking risk and overloading the work? No. What you should do here, use one methodology. Either you do modeling, you can do modeling based on some experimentation, you do experimentation only, you do some observation with statistical treatment, or you do some qualitative research with some kind of um, triangulation, maybe some focus group discussion or some interviews or something like that. So only one methodology. Also, you can outsource in your proposal up to from 10 to 12,000 uh, euros uh, any service. So if you need to make a website or a tool or any service that will be uh, tedious, uh, not relevant, uh, time consuming for sure and, and you can outsource it. You are allowed in the proposal that you say I will hire a company or I will call for a company or I will issue a tender so that a third party uh, will provide me this service or provide me with this product so that you can accelerate the process. This is also showing maturity. Also, you have in your methodology to show 
when are you going to acknowledge, uh, uh, acquire any new knowledge? And at the end, the methodology should be simple, clear, systematic, and for sure, one of the most strong parts is that you show in your methodology that you are going to generate a data set or you are going to publish a data set or share your data set. All these parts of the methodology. But in general, my recommendation always is that the methodology is corresponding to work packages. Every work package uh, corresponds to uh, concrete deliverables and that all that at the end forms an effort or a work needed for publishing one paper uh, in a journal uh, and maybe a conference paper. So by that, you have a very simple methodology, very clear to the point you work on something. We are not doing a postdoc to show our muscle and flex them and putting a lot of information, a lot of methodology, avoid all that. Methodology very simple, straight wor forward, one type of methodology already that you are mastering. Maybe you can say I will acquire some technical skills by visiting another lab and by that you have a consistent, well-rounded proposal. I hope this presentation was helpful. If you have any information necessarily look at the previous videos I have on my playlist on qualitative research or on academic modules or on scientific publishing so that you can get more familiar with anything missing or you could not understand the presentation. Otherwise than that, I wish you all the best of luck. Don't hesitate to share this presentation. This presentation was about winning a postdoctoral fellowship under the Marie Sklodowska-Curie action. Best of luck. Thank you very much.